All right, well, welcome everyone. Uh, we're very happy to have Kate Marshall here from UC Press. Um, before I introduce uh, Kate, I want to remind you that we are here to support research culture in the school. And we are also going to be having uh, an editor, Susan Ferber from Oxford University Press. Thanks to Laura. And that is, I think, in March, March 8th or something? March 12th. No, March 12th. 12th. Anyway, it's on our calendar. And then we're also looking at possibly a Punctum Press panel with both the editor and some faculty who have published at Punctum. And uh, in addition, we are subscribers to this webinar called Writing and Publishing. And uh, you don't have to watch the webinar at the time that it's streamed. You actually, as a member of our community, can access these at any time after they've been posted. And you have access to all of the what the webinar and the other posted materials. So if you're interested in exploring writing and publishing after today, <laughs> as I assume you will be in one way or another, uh, we do encourage you to take advantage of this resource that we're making available to UCI. I also want to acknowledge Ed Dinenberg, who is on the UC Press editorial board. And that we have another, Mark Levine is not here, but he is also on the UC Press editorial board. So. These are also resources for you if you're interested in UC Press. They can maybe advise you or tell you about who the editors are or be a little bit of an interface should you want that. So Kate Marshall, is she's the anthropology editor for UC Press. I think you also do the Latin American studies. studies. Uh, Rachel Atul is our initial, Rachel Atul is our initial contact to bring you down here. Uh, and of course, Rachel publishes in that area. Um, she um, was received a master's degree in Latin American studies at UC Berkeley and then joined the press in 2008. And she manages several award winning lists anthropology, food studies, and Latin American studies. And uh, in 2013, she launched a new list in Latin American history. And across fields, she's interested in books that contend with environmental and social justice issues. Um, so she's going to be talking about academic publishing and UC Press today. And then we'll have a chance to um, be a little bit social <coughs> after her after the Q and A period. Should anyone want to chat with her briefly? She has to be over in anthropology for appointments, but um, she'll be available to chat briefly. Uh, for a bit in this room. Great. Thanks so much, Julia. I try not to talk too long so that there's plenty of time for people to ask questions. Um, thank you, Rachel. Hi, Ed. So um, I appreciate the invitation to come down and speak with you. So as Julia said, I'm an editor at UC Press. Recently, I took on the anthropology list, but for about eight years, I've been acquiring on food and Latin America across fields. So while right now most of the books I publish are by social scientists, I have published a lot of historians and have published in other fields within the humanities, but also feel that I can represent uh, new initiatives and uh, trends that affect humanities publishing. So I want to talk about a couple of things today, and, and as I said, leave plenty of time for um, questions. The first is I want to talk about trends in publishing and the so-called crisis of publishing amid <laughs> declining book sales. Two, I want to talk about new initiatives that the press is developing in response to declining sales. Um, and three, I want to talk about authors, how authors should think about pitching their books in this climate. Mm -hmm. If a bunch of stickies appear with passwords on them, <laughs> that is not intentional. Let me know. <laughs> okay, so UC Press. Um, are advancing knowledge and driving change. Um, so this year we're celebrating our 125th anniversary. Um, founded in 1893, UC Press publishes in a wide range of scholarship in the humanities, social sciences, and sciences. We are one of the six largest US uh, university presses. Um, and of those six large university presses um, in the US, we are the only one based in the West, and we are the only one associated with a public university. Um, which is very important to us. Um, we think of ourselves as not a regional publisher, but publishing from a West Coast state of mind. Um, we publish 30, about 32 journals. I don't have the exact number. And typically between 180 and 200 new books a year. And we keep about 4,000 titles in print. Um, 
about one fifth of everything we publish is by UC faculty. Um, despite a lot of people are under the assumption that university presses are made massively subvented by their universities and some are more than others. We receive a very small subsidy from the University of California. It's really not that much. Um, and some of it goes to support UC faculty research and our faculty editorial board and we get a little bit of money towards operating costs. But um, we are a business and um, most of our budget comes from selling books. So, but interestingly, most books we publish lose money. So, <laughs> so therefore, um, subsidy plays a really important part of um, the university uh, publishing or press publishing landscape. Um, either subsidy comes either from an author's home institution or from our foundation. Um, while we are a nonprofit, we're a business, and like all university presses, we must sell books in order to cover our operating expenses. So. Um, so all university presses have different strengths, and, and at California, we try to maintain active lists in areas where we consider ourselves to be leaders. So within the social sciences, we're best known for our lists in anthropology and sociology, and we now have new lists in criminology, communications, and psychology. Um, within the humanities, history, and we have specific areas of focus within history, art history, music, cinema, classics. And in the sciences, our, our list is pretty much focused on ecology and the environment. Um, my boss likes to say that we publish in areas where we are one of the top two or three presses publishing in that area. I think ranking presses is a little subjective. <laughs> and um, so I, you know, I, but I do think that all of the editors want to be very dominant and well-respected in their respective fields. So, more often than not, what a press chooses to publish in is a business decision. Um, you know, publishing and supporting a marketing program for a specific field costs a lot of money. So if we're gonna publish in an area, we wanna be really committed to it. Um, uh, so, so for example, um, criminology, communication, and psychology are new areas that were identified as having growth potential, particularly in higher education markets. Um, several lists have been eliminated over the year. Poetry was one um, that ended a couple of years ago. Literary and scholarship. Liter yeah. Yeah, well, we've never really published in literary studies in the are eliminated due to lagging sales or, or what is perceived as a waning reputation, where we're really not truly leading and fully supporting that program. So, is there a crisis in publishing? <laughs> Lots of people talk about this. Um, part of why I'm here is to try to demystify what people are talking about when they talk <laughs> about a crisis and um, sort of articulate some of the larger dynamics of the publishing landscape and help you identify and understand some of the pressure, pressures that we're under today. Um, publishing is a rapidly shifting space. Um, in the 10 years that I've worked at the press, a lot has changed. Things are quite different from when Ed used to work at the press. <laughs> you know, we can talk about the good old days. Um, change is constant, and this is especially true as markets have changed and also technology has evolved. I'm gonna focus on a few trends that are particularly relevant to scholarly publishing, but I do wanna emphasize that some of the changes are actually good for scholars. So let's start with bookstores. <laughs> 20, 20 years ago, there were 4,000 bookstores in the US, um, independent booksellers. Um, then Barnes and Noble and Borders came onto the scene and they were the enemy, even though I was in high school drinking my coffee and Border, I loved them, but, um, but they were destroying the independent book business. Um, and I think uh, by 2009, there were only 1,500 independent bookstores. Um, although bookstores are actually rebounding a bit, there are about 2,000 in the US right now. Um, but you know, as we all know, what shipped is Amazon came onto the scene. Um, Amazon has changed the book selling landscape for good. They control about 22%, um, almost a quarter of the book market. Um, and at UC Press, half of our sales are on Amazon. They are our biggest customer by far. Um, and that's not even counting the used book market on Amazon, that's new book sales. So we love local bookstores, but the reality is bookstores have become a show place where people discover books and then go home and buy them on Amazon. Or if you're my husband, he buys them on his phone while we're at the bookstore and I scream at him. So, um, <laughs> um, so um, 
you know, people discover books in bookstores. Bookstores remain important for that purpose, but it's really not a significant part of our business model. So uh, I hate to point this out, but along with the decreasing number of bookstores, you're not likely to be sent on a book tour um, to bookstores by your publisher anymore. Even commercial presses aren't really doing this anymore, um, with very limited exception. So, okay, what else has changed? The library. So as many of you know, library budgets are declining. At the same time that library budgets are declining, science journals are getting more and more expensive. So a greater percentage of the library budgets that are getting smaller and smaller are going to pay for science journals that are considered essential to universities. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that means that um, there's been this really big shift in that um, librarians are starting to not think about building collections. Instead, they talk, think about granting access. So providing access to students and scholars within a particular institution to digital content. So that means that the way a lot of libraries are providing, are, uh, rather than buying a book for their archive, they're subscribing to like, uh, EBSCO or uh, Project Muse or one of these digital aggregators who provides digital access to an ebook. And UC Press, because we have to, we sell collections of our books to these digital aggregators who are third parties, um, who are then selling digital access onto libraries. The other big shift with libraries is this um, patron-driven acquisition, meaning a book has to be requested two, three, four, five times before the library decides to purchase a copy. So for what it's worth, it's worth asking your friends to request the book, <laughs> your book from your, their library. Um, um, but that in, that in reality is how libraries are making decisions about what to buy. Um, I would say um, when I started at the press, we there were about four to five hundred uh, libraries that bought every single thing we published, no matter what. It was as if they subscribed to the full press catalog, all two hundred books. That number is less than a hundred now, and it's actually closer to fifty with every passing year. So. Very, very few libraries are building massive collections, and this has had a really profound impact um, on our ability to um, operate as a business. So, okay, distribution and printing is also a major change that's happened. Um, and this is really, uh, you know, I don't want to dwell too much on this, but, um, you know, some of this is like the rise of the ebook and the fact that you can disseminate scholarship digitally now. I actually think <clears throat> scholarship's a lot more discoverable. Um, Ebooks are good for scholars, um, uh, you know, in terms of search words and books getting indexed in um, databases over time. You can fill out, you, now when you uh, transmit your book to production, you have to provide keywords not only for your book, but for your each chapter. Um, so anyways, there's a lot of exciting ways in which your book uh, will eventually be discoverable online. Um, but the other big changes is um, has to do with digital printing um, that has allowed print on demand to um, emerge as a super useful um, way uh, that publishers are now keeping books in print in perpetuity. Um, Ten years ago, a print on demand book looked like a bound photocopy. I'm not kidding. <laughs> That's not true anymore. I mean, you it's unless you are a publishing professional, it's extremely hard to identify what book was print on demand versus something that was bound more traditionally and archived in a warehouse. A lot of the smaller university presses, their, their entire <clears throat> as when a book initially might sell a few hundred copies in the first year, hopefully they sell some more, a few more hundred copies the next year, but over time they start to sell only five, 10, maybe 20 copies a year. Well, it's extremely expensive to keep a massive inventory and print huge volumes for a book that is only gonna sell five copies a year for the next 40 years. But if you use print on demand technology, you can keep, so what we would have to do before is put those books out of print. And then they were only available from libraries and not available from the bookseller. Print on demand allows us to keep things in print forever. We're actually bringing a bunch of books back into print now because of this technology. So anyway, a lot of people are frightened of POD. It is, your book does come directly from the printer, but in many instances it arrives sooner than it would if it came from our warehouse. So um, it's not a technology to be afraid of. Um, 
But I would also say that we still print um, and create beautiful, lavish, color books. Some of them are for general readers. Some of them come with massive endowments, particularly in the field of art history. Um, Ebooks are not dominating um, the, our, our publishing landscape right now in terms of sales. I, um, uh, I think only about 7 to 10 percent of our books are, are purchased as an ebook. Um, and this is really different than certain genres of commercial publishing, which, you know, romance or science fiction, it's about 75 percent of books purchased are ebooks now. So, other trends worth mentioning um, this doesn't have such an impact on university press landscape, but the consolidation of publishers. Um, so, so for, uh, you know, like a lot of the big houses are either combining or buying up. So this actually creates fewer opportunities to publish. Um, I, I would also, I, I mean, Relage was bought by Taylor and Francis. That was kind of big news in my universe, uh, but it's just something to be aware of that's happening. Um, People don't adopt books in the same numbers that they once did. This has had a massive impact on our business model. Um, I am told that, uh, you know, I have an author at Harvard who says she can't, uh, she can't assign more than 60 pages per week to her students because they're too busy or something like that. And that was like shocking to me because I would think like at Harvard, don't, wouldn't you have Imagine to read? Like here. <laughs> But I, I actually find that where people are still using books are like liberal arts colleges, but it's not, it's not the, um, it's no longer the norm to um, adopt 10, 12 full um, paperback uh, copies of, of a book in a classroom. Um, and then the other thing, so we do get some sub rights revenue for people who legally go through the process of clearing permission faculty, but many faculty don't. Many faculty scan and throw stuff up on websites and um, you know, I, I'm, no I'm not, I'm not judging. I'm just, I just, it's important to recognize that it contributes to the current crisis that we're in, in university press publishing. Um, selling books that sell in the classroom is extremely important to keeping us afloat and also disseminating knowledge. But, um, one, this is a little bit different going in a different direction, but there are fewer and fewer traditional review outlets for books. Um, so you may have noticed if anyone subscribes to the New York Times, the book review section, like every year is like one, one or two pages shorter. Um, there are very few um, full-time uh, uh, book review critics employed with magazines and journals now, and that's just something that we have to think about in terms of pitching and getting um, getting the word out about the wonderful books we publish. Um, but with that said, there are entirely new ways of promoting content, connecting with niche audiences. And we're going to talk about this more later, but social media has really changed um, opportunities that all presses have to um, promote and, um, and disseminate information. About So um, <clears throat> trade and textbooks are one method. Um, so does, do people know what trade a trade book is, what that means when I say? So a trade book is a book intended for general audiences. Um, so meaning that um, a book that you might see at a bookstore, um, uh, generally those books have a deeper discount than other books. So they're, they're much cheaper on Amazon um, than most monographs that you would see published by University Press. Um, and they sell in greater volume. So most university presses have, um, or at least of California size, have a legitimate trade program. Um, often the books that we publish are works of translational scholarship. So people who are academics but have big public profiles. Um, and sometimes they're breakout books that are just written in a particularly um, excellent way um, that make them um, marketable to a broader audience. Or sometimes they're academics who have amazing platform. So I work with Marian Nessel, who wrote the book Food Politics. Mm -hmm. Marian's, a, uh, Marian's books are very, very dense and very difficult to read. Um, they're really legit works of scholarship, but they sell like trade books because of her just amazing platform and ability as an advocate um, for challenging food politics today. So. Um, so one thing that university presses have been doing, and California included, is to think about expanding our trade programs, but also our textbook programs. So 
books that are intentionally designed for the classroom as a way to support the continued publication of monographs. Um, the other thing that we're doing, which I'm going to talk more about, is coming up with new models of publishing that are focused on authors bringing in subsidy. So specifically, and I've got some handouts here that everyone's welcome to grab one, but um, Luminos is our new open access initiative. It was something I was absolutely not interested in when they <laughs> first told us we had to start publishing open access books, and now I'm a super fan, um, and we'll get into that. So, okay, so what is Luminos? Luminos is, um, is a subvention-based publishing model where it's the same everything, same peer review process, same vetting structure, um, we still work with an editor, um, same quality copy editing, etc. except that the author brings in subvention from their home institution or a private support. Um, and we also have this library, I'll talk about library subscriptions, but we have subsidy, we use our own subsidy, and we sell a certain number of printed copies of the book because all books that are in Luminos are, have a free digital book and a print-on-demand paperback that's priced affordably. Mm -hmm. so, um, so the idea being that I, I, a lot of monographs cost between twenty dollars to $30,000 to publish, and we only make a fraction of that back. Some of the streamlining and things that publishers have been doing, but we in particular, have tried to lower the cost of publishing a monograph to about $15,000 per book. It's actually higher than that, so this pick is not totally accurate. But, um, but the idea being if we split the cost, so if like half the cost of publishing the monograph comes from the author's home institution or, or through scholarship funding that we are raising money for, um, it allows us uh, to give the ebook away for free, knowing that we're not going to sell a lot of copies of that book. Um, it, it sounds scary to a lot of people. A lot of people think it's a different track. It's a different publishing track. It's like second rate scholarship, and that's not at all what it is. We don't have anything that doesn't meet our standard and our criteria of vetting through the peer review process into the open access initiative. Yeah, and I'm, uh, the other really exciting thing is that there are two books, um, the two top prizes for the Musicological Society went to two books we published, both of which are in Luminos and open access. So, um, so uh, what to think about what's different is it's a different business model, and it's one that is explicitly focused on subvention coming in, and again, the exchange is the free ebook. There are some real benefits to being in Luminos. One, you can have color in your book if you're okay with digital color printing. So if you have complex maps and graphs, you get to have color in your book. Um, two, your ebook can be an enhanced ebook. You can have audio files, you can have video, you can have um, all, and there are a lot of different options, hyperlinks to, to websites and stuff that you wouldn't have in a traditional ebook. Um, Another benefit is you get extra marketing support because we now have marketing colleagues who are specifically charged with marketing and, um, and, and working on the Luminous title specifically in addition to the normal marketing that you would get as, um, as part of publishing with California. But, um, and then the other thing that's just really amazing about it is anyone can read your book and it's more discoverable online than, a, than an ebook that you could, um, that you can, uh, that you pay for. So anyway, I, it's a really interesting program. I, I want to continue talking about it, um, and I'll answer questions about it when we get to the end. Um, my author, Nancy Pistero, who's, a, who's at UC San Diego, is an anthropologist who used to complain that um, she studies politics in Bolivia. I love her work. Her colleagues in Bolivia can't access her first book. And so she, and we have subvention to pay for UC faculty to be part of this, although we're still asking people to go to their departments and get whatever they can. But San Diego is one of our like star library um, members. So they're, they are paying for 10 faculty every year to be part of Luminos. And so Nancy was like, sign me up because instantaneously the world can have access to her book. You can read it on a computer, you can download it as a PDF, you can download it as an EPUB and read it on your Kindle. It's just really changing the options, particularly for people who work with a lot of colleagues who are in countries that cannot afford to buy scholarship that's produced and published in the United States. So. Okay, so what does this all mean for my book? Remember, 
Scholarly publishing has always been rapidly changing. It's never been easy to publish. <laughs> like it, the hurdle is high, the bar is high. Um, and university presses are gonna continue to need subsidy now and as far as I can tell in perpetuity. So, you know, and it's also important to keep in mind there are lots of disciplines where putting in subsidy is absolutely the norm. And at some institutions, um, junior faculty, when they are hired, are getting book publishing subventions as part of their negotiated contract. I get this all the time where people are at Michigan were like, oh, by the way, I have this, I have this five thousand dollars. What am I supposed to do with it? And I was like, just <laughs> give it to me. <laughs> just, like, just like tell them to send the check to us. <laughs> so, so, so where do you start? Okay, so I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about what all of this means for you in terms of getting your book published. So the first thing that I always say to people is really take time to craft your book, especially if you're writing a first book, and we'll, I'll come back to this, but, but take time with it to really think about what it is you're trying to communicate, what it is you wanna say, um, and try to put that down in a proposal. A lot of people approach me and they're like, no, 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 I, I didn't write a proposal, I don't wanna write the proposal. And you know, I always say to people that the proposal, <laughs> the proposal is, is <laughs> isn't just a document for your editor, although your editor is the first person, your prospective editor is the first person to look at it. It's something that I share with my marketing colleagues and other people at the press who need to know about your book in order to eventually one day go out and sell it. So it's worth your time. It doesn't, you don't have to write 25 pages and spend an entire semester developing this thing, but a nice, pithy, like at least three pages, but like five to seven synthesis of what you're trying to do. Um, you know, and what I really, really want to see in a good proposal is some sort of succinct articulation of what your original argument is. So, you know, the easiest, you know, the thing that I always say to people is like, okay, but why does your book matter? Like, what, you know, what's important about your work? And more often than not, what people, the way people frame their scholarship is to start talking about what their book is not or what some gap in the literature is or something like that. And I, I just promise you that's just a really boring way to talk about <laughs> your original work. You know, you, it's just, it's not about what, you know, it's, the reason somebody's never studied X, Y, or Z is not a compelling reason to publish a book. It's, it's we want to know, like, what is it that is fresh and new and exciting? Um, the proposal is your opportunity to answer these questions. Um, and like I said, not just for me, but it's also for all of my colleagues who have to go out and sell your book. And one thing to think about the role of editor is, 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 is to be your advocate at the press and to translate your scholarship from for your col my colleagues who are even one step farther removed from the manuscript. It's not to say that your marketing manager or your publicist won't take a look at your manuscript, but they're not involved in the same way in the early conversations. So the proposal is your opportunity to give them some talking points. So, so one thing that I suggest people do is to always write marketing hooks. I don't know why this isn't a standard part of proposal, but like free yourself from writing a paragraph. Just write three, five, six, like, you know, this is the first book to do X, Y, or Z. You know, <laughs> say whatever is controversial about what you're contending with. Anything that's sexy or related to contemporary issues, you know, like just use bullet points. Um, the other thing that I always say is that people, if your book can be in the classroom, you should definitely tell your perspective, say yes, book use in the classroom and tell the editor what classes it will work in, in what fields and what disciplines. Um, I mean, this is just invaluable, that really makes a difference in terms of how we anticipate how many copies of the books we will sell and how we allocate our resources. Um, so, you know, another thing to keep in mind is you should be writing for as large an audience as possible, but you should also be realistic about who your audience is. So, you know, if you're right, if you're revising your dissertation, your audience is larger than your committee. Um, if you're writing your second or third book, you want to think about speaking to a community broader than particular subfields. Um, you know, uh, at the same time, I often get proposals that are like, I'm writing, I'm writing this book for science and technology studies in East Asia, you know, blah, 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 blah. And my book is for general readers. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's to be, it's okay. You are publishing scholarship. Most scholarship is read by other academics and students. Like you don't, you don't need to, um, 
uh, frame your audience as being kind of like pie in the sky. It's going to get reviewed in the New Yorker. I already told you there are no book reviewers anymore. Just, you know, you can free yourself of that kind of pressure. Um, but so again, like I want you to, we want to see you be ambitious and speak to as broad an audience as possible, but also be realistic about who's likely to read your book. Um, and then the other thing that people just time and again fail to do is to highlight their platform. A very, it's, your book proposal should always can include your biography. And yes, an editor can go to your website and look at your biography, but those websites rarely include many of the interesting places where you have spoken or, um, you know, like what I have this, um, I don't think she would mind me mentioning, I have this author, Christy Gordon, who is publishing a monograph um, do you know, Christy, um, about um, 20th century Mexican, US Mexican politics or whatever. And when she sent me the first draft of her proposal, she didn't mention that she was the editor of NACLA <laughs> and she has published in Jacobin and she, you know, she's just all over the place as a public intellectual. And her presumption is that I wouldn't care because it's not related to her monograph. But of course I care, you know, and my marketing colleagues, when we sit and present the books that we pitch to request a contract, my marketing colleagues are sitting there Googling everyone, looking to see if people have a Twitter profile, looking to see if they've had a TED talk or been here or there. So if you're doing any of that, you should definitely put in your proposal, even if you're publishing a scholarly monograph. Um, and, right, and I've said this before, but if you're revising a dissertation, it's imperative that you revise before you contact the press. Um, because editors will, university presses do not publish unrevised dissertations, no matter, I don't, everybody tells me they wrote their dissertation as a book. That's not an original line. So, so if, you know, if it's just worth it to take a break, you know, work on some articles, do something else for the, a bit, then come back and start revising. And I also want to point out, if you're close to finishing your manuscript, it's better to finish your revision before approaching press, the presses. Um, you know, a lot of people want an advanced contract because it because of the job market and et cetera, but um, you then have to go through peer review twice. And sometimes the peer reviewers who looked at your proposal and sample material are not available to read your full draft manuscript. So you might get uh, a third or fourth or maybe a fifth opinion, um, which can be very confusing. I've seen that time and again with junior scholars. It's, it, it can be a, a really challenging thing to navigate. So if you're close to finishing your revision, it's better to finish your revision and then submit. It's always worth trying to connect with editors at your primary meeting. Um, you don't have to wait until you're done with your manuscript to try to connect with an editor. Um, you know, and, the, and I would encourage you to connect with an editor before sending a submission in. Um, I think we say we only publish about 5% of the unsolicited manuscripts that come to UC Press. So, um, but you know, often people will contact me at this, the AHA or, um, and we might start talking and then years later, they finally finish the project <coughs> and then we start the peer review process. So anyway, okay, so let's talk about platform again. Um, so your platform matters to us. Um, I, we can talk a little bit about Twitter because I'm, I have to do one of the Twitter feeds for the press and it, it's kind of like, I, to me, Twitter is this like outrage machine, echo chamber, <laughs> really? but, but it's, <laughs> But it's also this surprisingly awesome space for publishers and, out and authors to announce their work and engage with audiences that are both broad and fairly specific. Now, one thing I would say is it's never good to start your Twitter feed the month your book comes out and just to publish, you know, just to like promote your own work. That, that's not, that's, that's, that actually actively hurts your cause. However, if you are someone who is engaging in social media, uses Facebook, uses in a professional capacity, if you are, um, you know, on Twitter, it's always worth um, sharing, you know, sharing details about places where you're going to be speaking, letting people know that your book is coming out. A lot of my authors like to have pictures of their children holding their books and it goes, you know, like it'll get retweeted a million times and it's just, there's, <laughs> there, uh, you know, uh, social media is your friend and it's, I think a really, it can be a really productive way to um, bring attention to your work. And I'll also, 
one community of people who are really engaged with scholars or journal or with, with social media or journalists. So um, a lot of journalists discover scholarship through mm -hmm. these venues. Let's see. Um, yeah, again, this is just common sense stuff, but you are your best advocate when it comes to um, getting the word about your book out. The publishers do a lot to promote and ensure that your book um, is seen by the right audiences, but you need to think of your publisher as your partner and someone that you're working with and actively collaborating. A lot of people sometimes make the mistake in presuming that the press is going to make them a public intellectual. And it's like, no, we need you to come to the table with the platform and we'll work together to get the word out. And, um, and our most successful books are the ones often with authors who are most active. Um, I brought this, uh, for those of you who are writing a first book, I brought a printout of this blog post that my um, Michelle Lipinski at Stanford University Press, um, who does anthropology and law and society, um, wrote this great little piece about um, publishing your first book. And it's, uh, she uses this phrase, like, don't get published, get read. So, so think about choosing a press and, or think about writing your book not as about um, the book object itself, but as bringing attention to your scholarship and what you do. Because a lot of people who will discover your work are never actually going to read your book or they might buy it and it might sit on a shelf or they probably won't buy it because nobody buys books anymore. But, um, but that doesn't mean people don't know who you are or what you're doing. And so there are opportunities to, um, to you know, ex expand that way and, and spread word about the value of your work. Okay, so I want to go back and talk about Twitter. This is a picture of me when I was like 25. Um, so, um, so I just want to talk about social media. Again, if it's, in, if it's inauthentic, if it doesn't work for you, don't, don't do it. Um, we have this thing called the Author Toolkit on UC Press's website. If you go to four authors, um, and it is like speaking at the most basic level, like how to open a Facebook account, but it was really created because there was a certain generation of authors who just didn't know how to engage with this. But also we want to have an open conversation about how these tools are really, can really help you market um, uh, and sell yourself, both in terms of um, finding a publisher who wants to work with you, but also um, um, eventually when your book comes out. So. Um, so I just, this is Educated Palettes. Um, UC Press was the first university press to launch a formal list of food studies, which I had the great fortune of inheriting um, about eight years ago. It's a four part list. It's a really interesting interdisciplinary list that a lot of you, it, it's, um, it's the California Studies in Food and Culture, which is edited by Derek Goldstein, who's a Russian literature professor at Williams College. Um, it's the journal Gastronomica that was also founded by um, Dara. Um, a small collection of cookbooks that are kind of like cultural objects, um, that's how I describe them, and, and wine books. Um, we at the press were a little bit early to Twitter, and I have a colleague who created this Educated Palettes um, Twitter feed um, to just promote the food and wine books. Now, it turns out it, a lot of things coincided with it being a particularly exciting moment in the foodie universe, but what was great about this feed is that a lot of the people, of the 10,000 people who follow this news about scholarly books on food, mm -hmm. um, a lot of them are big names, you know, like people like Mark Bittman and like big name um, food, uh, food writers and some chefs, but, um, but it's really, uh, what's exciting about it is that um, these books that I publish that, you know, normally have a relatively modest audience, um, people know about them. And my authors get invited to um, go speak all over the world because, not, not necessarily because of the Twitter feed, but because of the reputation of the list. And I think the Twitter feed has helped um, and allowed us to speak to this particular niche community um, who are not just scholars, right? Who are people who are interested in a theme and a topic. So that's an example. of um, a social, um, yeah, I, I published this book on the history of ramen a number of years ago. <laughs> That's very, very scholarly, lovely book, but it's a, it's a monograph in the truest form. But, and I, everywhere I go around the world, that book is like sitting on shelves <laughs> and it got reviewed in men's health and like all sorts of unlikely venues, but um, it's, it's fun. So another thing to think about is whether or not, um, you know, one thing when we talk about platform, we want to know, are you pitching op-eds? Are you part of public conversations? Are you producing think pieces related to your work? 
or even if it's not related to your scholarship, is it related to your work as a teacher, as a professor? Um, my author, Maggie Gray, wrote this amazing book, Labor in the Locavore, that's been very important in food studies. Um, she was one of the first people to talk about how this whole concept of like eating ethically was excluding labor from the conversation. Well, it turns out three or four years later, Jacobin's doing like a special labor issue on food and Maggie is the expert person to be able to speak. So she was able to synthesize her book and write a short piece for Jack Jacobin that went viral and was shared 7,000 times on Twitter um, and went viral on Facebook. So, you know, these are things, these are opportunities that didn't exist 10 years ago in the same way. It's very easy to connect with the, I mean, Jacobin has, there are a lot of professors who are editors at Jacobin, so they are actively looking for scholarship from about left or labor political issues, but, um, but this is not the only outlet. And uh, within the humanities, there are a number of online or um, web-based uh, venues where, um, where people publish. So, so for example, um, this is one of my authors, Henry Nodeker, who's a literary studies professor, um, wrote this wonderful history of cookbooks, analyzing history, or cookbooks as a literary text. He's not on social media, he's not an active, but um, the Atlantic has this active blog and they're constantly looking for content for the blog. And because of the relevance to um, the interest in the topic with their food editor who runs the blog, um, we were able to run an excerpt on that. So, you know, just because you're not, if you're not active on social media, it doesn't mean there aren't outlets, but it's important to think creatively and work with the press to think about how you can get your work out there. Um, so, yeah, and then the other thing I would say is if you write on anything that is related to contemporary political issues, you know, please, please, like, figure out how to talk about your work in a way that um, can be pitched broadly. Um, in 2015, I published this book, The Land of Open Graves, uh, with Jason DeLeon, um, that's about yeah. migrants who die in Sonora when they're crossing the desert. And it's, it's, it's a rare work of scholarship that has already sold something like 15 or 16,000 copies. Um, um, it's, it's also been a book that's very significant for the field of anthropology. But what's amazing about this is um, the book has had this wonderful afterlife in that we're getting, we didn't get a lot of media pickup when the book was initially published in part because Donald Trump was running for president and it was extremely difficult to get media interest in anything we were publishing during that time because of the news cycle. But years later, okay, now we're talking about immigration now we're talking about the wall and um, Jason won a MacArthur Genius Grant, we were able to continue to promote the book. And then just two weeks ago, this illustrated review of the book appeared on the back page of the New York Times book review. Um, just out of the blue, we didn't know it was gonna be. And so again, like one of the things that I think is really important to keep in mind as scholars and people who are producing scholarship is that, you know, you, media, or, you, journalists, society looks to academics to be thought leaders and to help inform public conversations about things that matter. So um, as an editor, one of the most exciting things I do is publish books that are part of, of um, you know, um, these public conversations that, um, that either, you know, change the way we understand uh, everything that's wrong with the universe or um, contend with the problem. Okay. So I just want to end a little bit about talking about publishing fit and how to pick a press. Um, I think, um, you know, the reality is most university presses more or less offer the same thing. We editors talk shit about each other. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I mean, I try not to, but people like editors just say the craziest things about other presses. Like apparently there's some, um, I don't know, if Mark or Ed, if you've ever heard this, but apparently other editors tell authors that UC Press contracts are provisional because our faculty editorial board has to approve our books, which doesn't make any sense because every every university press has a peer review process and has a board. It's like so they're just you know they're these like little talking points or whatever. That so the truth is that I think more or less university presses offer the same thing. Um, you can pick a publisher. I, I think California tends to be very committed to publishing um, 
books that are political from the left, um, deal with environmental issues, but not in every field and not in every area that we publish. Um, I think one of the things that I would really emphasize is that it's important to find an editor and a press who's active mm -hmm. in the field that you publish and don't look at their backlist. So we start referring to books as being part of the backlist as soon as they're about two, three years old. So you want to know like what is the, what did, um, if, you're, if you're an anthropologist, you want to know what the anthropology editor published in the last two or three years. Because you can't even see what they have in their pipeline under contract, right? Um, you don't want to approach a press because, so, so for example, we published all these uh, translations of Foucault. Um, I still get like lots of like submissions in um, philosophy and they're like, oh, I'm coming to California because you published Foucault. And it's just like, well, we don't, we haven't had a philosophy editor for a very long time. So, um, so, and that means we're also not actively marketing your field. So you, again, it's important to connect with a publisher who is in your area. Um, and, um, you know, I would say, yeah, it's super important to find an editor who's excited about your work. Um, you know, I think that the, the title editor is really a misnomer. My job is more to be like a sponsor or advocate. I, there are books that I developmentally edit. There are books where I provide um, really specific feedback to my authors, but many books I publish don't have my red pencil marks all over them because they come in neat and tidy and they go through mm -hmm. peer review and um, they're really ready for production. So I, it's important to think about your editor not as the person who's giving you uh, line edits, because they most probably are not going to be giving you edits on a significant part of your manuscript. Um, but you have to think about them as the person who's like your champion at the press. They're the person who is fighting for your book for resources or double checking to make sure that your book is on the list going to the appropriate conference. And they're the person who has to, um, you know, convince their marketing colleagues that the book needs to, you know, attention for this one this reason, X, Y, or Z. Um, they're also the person you have to go to when there's a problem. So, so it's important that you pick someone that you feel like gets your book, someone that you trust, someone that you can communicate with. Um, you know, and then other than that, you should just, the, the other things that are worth finding out about is like, how long does it take the press to publish a book? Some publishers, you know, UC Press, our average production schedules, it's like between seven and eight months. There are other presses where it takes 14 months to publish the book. If that matters to you, you need to ask those questions before you sign your book contract. So I think that's it. I just want to leave time to answer questions because I, more often than not, I find that like people have more questions than, um, than there's ever time for. So I don't want to keep going on. I have to say that was very, very illuminating. And <laughs> although we, we've listened to a lot of these talks, you really brought in some new things and new perspectives. And so I'm really very grateful. Yeah. I'd like to open it up to our, to our group. And also to recognize Mark Klein, who is also on the UC board. Um, I'd introduced Ed earlier. So I wanted to make sure that our faculty and grads know who our reps are. <laughs> to do that. I think there's one thing I would say that people should know and that you should really be nice to your editor. <laughs> because it's, it's a very hard job, it's a very stressful job. Your editor at any given point is probably working on 40 or 50 other books and has many mouths to feed. Uh, and uh, publishing can be frustrating. It's like every other aspect of life. There, 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 there are setbacks, there are challenges, but uh, what I think people in, the, in, in publishing really respond to is a professional author who's patient, who understands the process, and, and, and who understands that his or her book is not the only book that the press is published. No, I think I, when I give the revising your dissertation talk, one of my slides is about keeping it professional, <laughs> because you know there you have to keep in mind that we actually live in slightly different professional worlds. Like a lot of like me, I started graduate school right after um, right after college. I had not had like a real job before. You know what I mean? I, I just you have to keep in mind that um, there's sort of like decorum and it, you know, again, it's not personal. If an editor doesn't want to publish your book, it's rarely like a judgment of you. And 
<laughs> that person is uh, plays a really key role in getting your book into production. And be um, nice to everyone who's trying to help you. <laughs> just be nice. Just be nice. <laughs> but at the same time, if there's a problem, you should be able to go. Like I had a um, I had a former colleague who's not at the press anymore who was. Um, I, I, it was just crazy. It was actually that book, Labor and the Locavore, um, which is a scholarly monograph, but the New Yorker requested it, and the person answering that email ignored the request because they're like, oh, this is a monograph. This isn't a book for general readers, so I'm not going to follow through. It was a bizarre situation, and the, the author told me like six months later, and I really wish she had alerted me because we, you know, we A, we would have dealt with the situation, and B, like that, that colleague was misinformed. You know what I mean? So. So you want your editor to be someone where if you do have a legitimate problem, you can talk to them about it. So I think Mark had a okay. comment. Mark too. and Rachel has comments. This is something we, we sort of deal with on individual <laughs> book basis and meetings, but I wonder you guys as editors looking at it more broadly, how do you this whole need to write for the public, like to write everything in a quote unquote accessible style, um, and yet to do monographs. I mean <laughs> How do you, when you're looking at, at a submission, how, how much, especially if it's for a monograph or a dissertation turned into a first book, you don't really have the chance to really yet, unless that's your style or your writing in a genre that, that allows that more, mm -hmm. to write for the public or more accessibly, less footnotes or even somehow no footnotes or something, but still scholarly, obviously based on a lot of research. How much does that play into your decisions about whether they're signed? I think, I mean, I think it plays a lot um, in the sense that, I, I mean, the, the stuff that ends up being like a hallmark of like this dissertation hasn't been adequately revised is when you get these like massive, massive literature reviews and really um, obsessive kind of like uh, too much detail about theory rather than just simply synthesizing what, um, you know, like what, what is your Foucaultian analysis or whatever. It's just like when you start to get, um, you know, five, six, seven, ten paragraphs where you're reading about other people's work, you're not reading about the book itself. And that's usually just feedback that I give an author and then it's on them to decide whether or not they want to revise and come back to me. Um, but, uh, but I hear you. But also, I mean, keep in mind that one broad public for books is a student audience. So um, not all books are going to be used in the classroom, um, but that's a good audience to aim for um, in terms of thinking about clarity of writing. Um, that isn't necessarily the genetic, right? Um, but, but students are still a population that buy books and, and in order for a book to work successfully in the classroom, it has to be written in a manner that's clear enough that it can be understood with someone who doesn't have significant expertise in, in the field. So I, that, that's often a metric I use, like would it, you know, would a, a hungover 19 year old, like, you know, like, a, I, I don't know, Mike, I'm just like, but but there are, you know, there are books um, that are super specialized and will always have, like I'm, I'm encountering a lot of this in anthropology where there is, there are particular um, traditions of writing in anthropology that are so theoretical that I, I, they, I, they make me nauseous. And I, um, it's been challenging to try to figure out. And in that circumstance, I rely heavily on readers and trusted advisors to tell me when someone's totally off base or when, no, this person's, ontological analysis is groundbreaking, you know, <laughs> so does that is yeah. a little bit? I think it affects history too in the humanities more than most because we're not as people don't assume we're doing things as esoteric as nuclear physics or, you know, or some kind of specialized writing or even anthropology, which has a much more uh, tradition of writing in that style. And yet what we do is actually that complex and we're expected to somehow present that in a way that a hungover and a will not only be able to open it, but want to open it. I mean, this is a, goes back to that question of platform. Your book might be very esoteric and specific and speak to a very specific academic audience, but that doesn't mean you can't be a talking head and expert and translate kind of some of the bigger picture. And, you know, we are really excited about that too. You know, a book that, um, the monograph is super specialized. However, the author, um, you know, so we have one of the series editors that I get to work with now that I'm doing anthropology is Tanya Lerman, who um, publishes trade books with commercial houses. She's a big public intellectual um, uh, anthropologist study. She wrote uh, this book on um, um, 
what is it called when um, when God talks back about uh, evil, um, uh, charismatic Christianity and but Tanya's series you know is very um, the books in the series are very uh, uh, on subjectivities are very theoretical and so I do think you know there there's a space for one can both be part of translating um, big ideas and um, be an expert uh, who gets quoted in the New York Times on X, Y, or Z, and also um, produce scholarship that is for uh, a modest audience. So. so, I don't mean to be too, but I would like to kind of go back to the, the question about how to work with an editor. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And not to toot your horn too much, but you're kind of known among Latin Americanists as mm -hmm. like the editor to work with. Because, That's nice. Yeah. But I don't know why. <laughs> no, I yeah. think it's just yeah. because I have fewer authors because I'm younger, so I'm yeah. more responsive. Anymore. And then you actually <laughs> work. <right? laughs> I work? That's so interesting. Um, <laughs> but if you could just say, what makes, what are three things that make a good editor? And what are three things that make a good author? Like we've talked about how to be nice to your editor. Right, right. But can you just give us like, what what three things can, so when, when a new a new author is working with an editor, they recognize, oh, this is good. Right. Like, this is what I want. Right. And so, okay, and an I, I would kind of actually flip it the yeah. other way and talk about that, um, you know, I think authors will bring a lot of expectation to the table that um, that I'm going to develop their book for them and dramatically improve their writing. And and the reality is, I have I have like maybe 85 books under contract right now, and I signed another 20. You know, and their um, last season I published 29 books. You know, I, I just it's um, and half of them were front list trade authors who um, need a lot of hand holding just because of this because I paid money for the book and yada yada and like uh, so um, I think people need to have a realistic perspective about what an acquisitions <laughs> editor do that's not to say there are some books or there are some authors where I end up getting super involved because sometimes there's a problem with the peer review you know um, or so, uh, and and they need a lot of guidance sometimes it's because I think my intervention will dramatically change like the sales potential of the book. Um, um, but most books I publish, I'm, I don't have a heavy hand in, um, but, what, um, but what I think a lot of my authors appreciate is transparency, that I think I'm just like very direct about like, okay, this is how long I think this will take, this is what you have to do, like this is, this is the next stage. And I think that sometimes editors can be a little or they make assumptions about what authors understand about the publishing process. So um, um, a couple of people that I compete with, I know have that reputation. So um, so that that might be something to look for in an editor if someone you feel that you trust them and you feel like they're being upfront. But I also think, like, keep in mind, like, I, I think editors say all sorts of weird things to authors to try to get them to sign their book and sign with them and stuff. So like, you don't, uh, you need to, to a certain extent be guarded but you know like i would also say is that it's a collaborative relationship and um i think if an author is or if an editor is genuinely excited about your project and you like them you should you should work with them you shouldn't make them compete for your book with three other presses you should start kind of like an open dialogue ask them if they're available to talk on the phone before you submit your book so that you're on the same page you know but those are all and if someone can't make time for that, that is a little bit of an indication of what they might be like to work with later. Mm -hmm. But also if an editor promises that they're gonna edit your entire manuscript, maybe don't believe them too. I mean, cause there are, um, uh, yeah, like there are some editors that I know who have gotten into trouble with this situation that over promising what they're able to offer authors. And um, you know, it, it you, it's not reasonable to think um, that a book that's going to sell two or 300 copies that would take 20 hours to develop um, is going to get that attention for free. You know, you can get that attention if you hire a developmental editor before you go through the peer review process. That's an option. Any editor will give you a list of developmental editors if you have research funds that can pay for that. But does that help? Okay. Hi, I'd like to follow up on that. And what is UC Press doing typically now for copy editing? 
Um, I think, so copy editing is one realm of the universe where authors never complain to me about their copy editing. Um, I do know that there are presses that are sending, are having copy editing done in India, which is super controversial and problematic in lots of different ways. Um, but, um, but most books we publish do not get as heavy a hand as they, they did 10 years ago. I'm seeing so, a real decline. Yeah. Because yeah. you pay for so they're doing a lighter copy of it. Um, but they're always, I mean, our, there are certain books, like if you're writing a book for general readers, it's never going to have a light copy of it. If English is your first link is not your first language, you're never going to have a light copy of it. Um, um, but is that typically something you can ask for as you're negotiating the contract? No. <laughs> yeah, you really aren't going to have any control over that at any press. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And but you could then pay a developmental editor to do some of that work. You can hire a developmental editor before you enter, produ enter production. They're not going to do copy editing, but that would be more of like a um, getting direct feedback. Um, some, you know, there, there are some of the smaller presses I think are asking people to do a copy edit before they go into production, um, which is just the state of the finances. And that's like the reality for books that are selling less and less. Uh, I had one question to start out with, but now I have more. <laughs> so maybe we'll start with the easiest one, which is uh, how much does a development tool edit? Oh, yeah. Um, so huge range. Um, I have a manuscript that a developmental edit was a particularly problematic trade book, and the developmental editor, who was absolutely top of his game, was $6,000 um, for two rounds of looking at the manuscript. But I see a lot of developmental editors that are like, 2,500, 3,000. Um, and then what they often do is they provide you with an out like comments, but also like an outline and a plan for revision. Um, and, and I do think it's money well spent if you have research funds that you can apply toward developmental editing. But it, it's something that I feel like people didn't really talk yeah. about 10 years ago, but the first time I've heard. a lot of former editors are starting little cottage freelance businesses doing developmental editing. Um, I, it's it can be invaluable. Uh, it's it's definitely something worth looking into. If, I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend spending your own money on that kind of thing, but um, but again, if you can apply some research funds to that, I I do think it's money well spent. So second question, hopefully it's real quick, is uh, what's the difference um, in the editorial process with the series as opposed to just one? Oh yeah, yeah of course. Um, so it's not really different, save for that your primary contact um, might be a series editor. Now, the press editor always gets to decide whether or not something moves forward. So sometimes a series ed and sometimes a series editor and a press editor might be in conflict about an individual project. So just because a series editor approaches you doesn't mean that the editor at the press might be interested in the book. However, um, basically they're they're like. Um, external contacts who help spread an editor's network. And I, you know, under most circumstances, the university press editor is working closely with their um, series editors to identify the people that they want to sign, uh, them to sign. And one thing that's nice, most series editors that I work with do um, provide additional comments on the manuscript. So it's just like, it's not peer review <laughs> per se, because uh, it's not blind, but it's just having like another person who you trust. Um, series used to be um, subscriptions for libraries, and now they're more honorific than anything else, um, or ways of grouping scholarship together. Yeah? This kind of goes back to, um, you know, uh, kind of playing out of the crisis question, and I'm interested in whether the extrapolation I'm making is correct, because it seems to go against the common sense of declining um, trends in journalism, mm -hmm. or even trade publishing. But from what you said, it seems like there isn't a crisis of readership. Oh, in that you're multiplying open access. So yeah, is there a crisis of readership? Like you figure out a public, but there is a public. Kind of I think there's a public that consumes media in a different way. So I don't know that people are reading a book front to back, but people are interested in what scholars are doing and able to discover it through journalism or through social media or other or TED Talks or like podcasts, like podcasts are this, are all these book reviewers who are doing podcasts now. I mean, that's just very fun. Um, but I think, um, 
Yeah, no, I mean, I think this is a strange moment in American society. I went to the Buenos Aires Book Fair not so long ago, a couple of years ago. I was went to this thing for international editors and or editors from not from Argentina, and it was really nauseating to me to see. Um, not not because I don't like it, but I, I felt sick about the United States because of just like the vibrant book culture in Argentina and um, um, just like the book fair is this big public event that big books bring their families to and the bookstores are just amazing. And I was meeting with all these publishers where these tiny little esoteric ensayos sell like 1500 copies, 3000 copies, and you know, books just don't sell in that way in the United States unless you're, you know, a celebrity, um, you know, like, like the what is the like next like Lena Dunham book or the whatever that um, eat up all the big advances and like suck all the air out of the room. But um, so no, I, I do think there is a little bit of crisis in terms of like American literary culture. But um, but I do, that's why we want to see authors who want to translate their work. But again, just to put things in perspective, like most monographs we used to publish would sell between 15 to 2,000 copies 10 years ago. And a lot of books sell less than 300 now. So, um, you know, and again, a huge chunk of that is library sales declining. But another big chunk is um, that people don't build libraries anymore and another chunk is people don't adopt books in the classroom anymore so yeah yeah just building off of that actually how many i know you said a fifth is uc faculty mm -hmm. but how much would you gauge as actually not or independent scholars or public intellectuals at university of california Press? oh University. interesting i don't know if i could quantify that but a lot uh, i'd say a lot of our front lists like trade the trade lists tend to be people who are not necessarily affiliated or, or they're like lightly affiliated with the institution. Like I just did a book with Raj Patel, um, who has like a, a kind of a title at the University of Texas at Austin, but he's not really a professor. He's a public intellectual. Um, Rebecca Solnit is one of our beloved authors who is not affiliated with an institution. So um, yeah, no, that, I don't think that's a that's not a bar to entry. Are so. those numbers increasing, you think, as a response to this sort of developing model of publishing? Or? You know, I don't know how to quantify that, but that's Just interesting. Um, yeah, potentially. Yeah. 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 So do you think that not having a university affiliation is a barrier to getting a contract at the university press? Um, you don't have the subventions for one thing. Well, the subvention. Well, so if you're publishing a super answer. specialized monograph, like, yeah, and I do think we live in this like honorific universe where it's like, oh, where is this person a professor? And oh, oh, this person got the job, the new assistant professor job at this university. Like, I need to talk to them. Like, editors definitely chase that stuff, like the job market. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I think also that. Th I wouldn't say that it, I'm, I just did a monograph on the history of Big Sur with an author who is not affiliated with the university, who, who's a historian, she's a scholar, um, but she came to an event at Davis and we started talking and it was just like this long collaboration of talking about her book um, and she pulled it off. So I, I, I don't think that there was, I don't think it was, nobody thought that it, it wasn't appropriate for us to publish her, if that makes sense. To eat some There's a question over here. So you're a new author and got your revisions and followed the quorum and whatnot. Um, is it polite to ask an editor or potential editor what books are in the pipeline? Yeah. And then, okay. And just to kind of get an idea as to where your work might fit. And what's sure. Ahead, sure. I, editors work. love to talk about who they're working with. They often <laughs> love to like brag about, I have this amazing book about the history of peyote coming out. You know, like I, um, yeah, I, that's true. I do. Um, so, <laughs> um, yeah, no, editors love, when's the book party? <laughs> um, oh, Margaret Chowning read it and she was a little like not, that into it, but um, I think it's a, a really cool book. Um, yeah, um, it's totally, absolutely appropriate to, um, yeah, and uh, you know, editors will often sell themselves that way. They're like, oh, I just signed this person, or I just signed that person, and you know, so sure, it's not secret. Uh, I, 
Okay, two more questions and maybe we'll then um, have a little socializing that people might like. So, you talk a little bit about, uh, about the first book. It's, it's just as, as, as you've been talking with and gathering that there, there are distinctions that you become aware of, not just in terms of you know, not wanting, don't submit the, the revised dissertation. The unrevised. Like the unrevised dissertation, but there seems uh, um, uh, there's a difference in expectation too on the editor's part. I don't know. Um, you mean in terms of what the book looks like? Uh, you said you mentioned something before about how the first book is sort of expected to be a bit more narrow in terms of its audience, and then this is like your second. Oh, book, oh. You should be trying to cross fields. Yeah, I mean, not, it, sometimes people get way more narrow in their second book. Although, yeah, um, uh, um, I also don't support edited volumes as your second book. Anyway, that I can talk about that more, but. Um, um, no, I mean, uh, we love publishing first books. Um, often people's absolute best scholarship is their first book. Um, sometimes that's our first book. So I, um, you, you know, I, some of them end up being broad. Some of them are very narrow. I, I think, I think you have to, you have to identify what the truth is for your project, you know what I mean? And not represent it in a way that is either false or, but also don't undersell yourself. Um, I just think that like, the common patterns we see as editors um, are this tendency to believe that the dissertation doesn't have to be revised and um, this tendency to frame the merits of the project around kind of disciplinary conversations and not talk about like the originality of the work. Um, people often really undersell what's exciting um, and neat about the stories. Like I, I see this in history a lot with uh, revised dissertations out of history. Um, um, like people don't emphasize the fun sort of sexy narratives or 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 like they won't talk about what politically motivates them to do their research when which is strange for me as an editor like um, yeah I got into this with them um, uh, did you read Ted Beatty's book okay so the Mexican historian who studies 19th century Mexico ec does economic history it's pretty dry stuff in a way that he would identify he would say my book is you know, is dry, you know, or whatever. But when we were talking about it, and he's like, you know, he's talking about like import substitution and like producing Coke bottles and like all, all, all these different things. And, and I was like, this sounds so relevant to everything that people are talking about today. And it took a while, but he finally wrote this like this, this little conclusion about like, what is the importance of studying this history in terms of thinking about um, how we understand uh, relationships between countries and economics and the history of how these relationships are formed. And a lot of people keep coming to me and being like, I really love how Ted ended the book this way. And, <laughs> and he won like the cat's prize at AHA and not because of the way he ended the book. It's really excellent scholarship. But again, like I think, I think um, people are very reluctant to talk about like why why their work matters. And I just, I just really want to see people do that. And that's especially true for first books. Mm -hmm. so. And I think um, Mark was going to have has a, a, a closing question. No, you already did. Okay. Well, this was really revelatory. I learned a lot of new things. And again, I've been hosting these for years. So this was fantastic. And apparently she does a workshop on dissertation into book. Oh, yeah. Maybe that's next year, the year after we could bring Kate back. If she's willing. Um, of course, and I'm um, not the only person who does this talking. Well, we, want <laughs> we want Kate. No, our editorial director is very good at it. So, but um, but yeah, no, I um, yeah, and I'm like a like a you know, I know I don't publish in a lot of your fields, but feel free to take my card, and I can point you in the direction of the right colleague who would um, uh, if we you know if we but. If we don't publish in your field, I want one thing I wanted to say about open access that I didn't is there is a future in which we would be able to expand into other fields because of open access. That's we're not there yet because we're still in the pilot part, but um, and I certainly can't make any promises, but I, I see there being a universe in which we can go back into smaller fields um, with this sub with the subsidy model. Are there any questions from the, the streaming or are we cool, Jeff? Oh, okay, and so before you leave. Um, we're, we are going to hang out here for a while with Kate, but if you would please take a second to evaluate the session and give us any suggestions for future programming, uh, we would really appreciate it. Great, thanks. <laughs>